Chapter 4, Knife River National Historic Site in North Dakota. Casey sauntered down Village Trail passing the park's reconstructed Indian Earth Lodge. It was the park's most popular attraction and would be the focal point of his tours this summer. A bumblebee zipped past and landed on a nearby prairie rose. The wild pink flowers with their golden cores gave the dull prairie grass a much-needed vibrancy. It had surprised him to learn the area was once home to the legendary Sacagawea who joined the Lewis and Clark expedition from this location. He imagined her packing up everything in her earth lodge and leaving to explore distant lands with strangers at a moment's notice. Not unlike my life, he thought. The sound of a faint moan toward Knife River caught his attention. He picked up his pace. he just completed Temple University's Park Ranger Law Enforcement Academy, the JV version of the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center known as FLETSI. Seasonal rangers like himself needed the training to break into the field. Of course, his father had sent him to Knife River, where he couldn't carry a weapon or use any of the skills he'd learn at Temple. He couldn't see how this experience would get him a permanent law enforcement ranger position and a ticket to the real Fletzy training in Georgia. Casey looked down at his watch, a Casio G-Shock. The watchmaker had called its color flat, dark earth, but it looked like desert sand to Casey. It had been a gift to himself for graduating college, 8.52 a.m., Beekler usually arrived to work between 7 and 8, so the shots would have occurred over an hour ago. When he was in college, he fantasized signing in at sunrise to a park's command post as a law enforcement ranger at a prestigious national park like Yosemite, Glacier, Grand Canyon, or back at Yellowstone. He would even take a park up in Alaska with the added benefit of being stationed somewhere without cell phone reception. He'd read an article about people his age spending on average six hours a day on their phones. He tried to keep his usage under an hour and only when indoors if possible. If he had his way, he would only be reachable by radio, responding to emergency calls that took him via helicopter to the backside of a mountain to chase an illegal hunter or to save a hiker caught in an avalanche. He heard it again. The moan sounded like an injured animal, a familiar one at that. He jogged the rest of the trail and stopped at the edge of the river bluffs that hung over Knife River. The smell of algae and mud lingered in the air. There were reeds nodding in the wind and twigs drifting downstream. He scanned the reddish-brown clay riverbeds and listened. There was the mild sound of the river's current as it splashed against rocks on the water's edge. He tilted his head toward the chirp from a western meadowlark, but he couldn't pick up the animal sound again. He dropped to one knee and closed his eyes, waiting. The yelp came 20 seconds later. His head whipped up. He saw a thick cluster of reeds move upriver. Casey's boots slipped as he scampered down the river bluff, sliding the rest of the bank on his ass. He stopped just short of the water, a pile of mud stuck to the bottom of his boots. He kicked off the mud and hiked through the clay next to the river. The moan intensified as he approached the cluster of reeds. There he found a buffalo calf, not yet one year old, its hair turning dark brown and signs of a growing shoulder hump and horns. Its droopy dark eyes stared up at him. He wondered why it didn't run away, but then he saw its leg tangled in the reeds. Inching closer, he stopped when the calf grunted at him. It tried to break free, but couldn't. Easy, fella. Casey's tone was soft. It's okay, I won't hurt you. Looking closer, he saw blood trickling down the calf's leg. He checked his pockets and found his pocket knife in one and the Ziploc bag in the other. He pulled out the trail mix and left a few pretzels on a nearby rock. The calf tried to step away but couldn't, so Casey gave it space. After what felt like a three-minute staring contest, the calf lowered its head. It sniffed the pretzels and licked them. It looked back at him one more time and then lowered its mouth and ate the pretzels. Hey, little guy, where's your mother? He searched the area for larger tracks but couldn't find any. He peered across the river and that's where he saw it. A giant buffalo cow lying motionless on the opposite riverbank. There was a trail of blood from the buffalo flowing into the river. No. His voice cracked. Who would kill a buffalo? Maybe a pack of wolves? He shook his head. That couldn't be. They would have caught the calf without a mother to protect it. And Beekler heard gunshots. Casey's throat tightened. He dug his nails into the palm of his hands. It was difficult for him to put into words when he operated the Red Dog program, but upon reflection, he felt a sense of kindred spirit with the buffalo. He was big and fast like a bison and tried to be kind and approachable with an underlying unpredictable streak. An inner beast he planned to unleash on people bent on evil. Perhaps it was his fascination with the wild west of old and the link the buffalo had played in that way of life. He sometimes felt like he understood how a buffalo might live, wandering vast tracts of unexplored land where challenges and opportunities waited around every bend. Past the calf's mother, there was an oil drill positioned upriver on the far side, just beyond the park grounds. What the hell? He hadn't seen the drill before. It was as if someone had assembled it overnight. A grunt brought his attention back to the calf. Casey opened his pocket knife, and the calf winced at the sight of the blade. I'm just going to cut you loose. He moved toward the calf, and again it tried to yank its body away. 
Hold up there, son. Casey almost shat himself. He spun around and saw an old man with a pistol in his hand. Whoa, what are you doing on park lands with that gun? The man inched the cowboy hat up his forehead and gazed down at the calf. This isn't for you. He stood higher than Casey perched on the riverbank. Casey raised his knife and slid to his side so he was in the firing path between the man and the calf. The man had two long braids that lay against his chest. He reminded Casey of Willie Nelson, except instead of a guitar, he had a gun. I won't let you kill him like you killed his mother. Casey crouched so he could lunge the knife at the man. The man raised an eyebrow for an instant before shaking his head. You're mistaken. I didn't kill his mother. This is a tranquilizer gun. We need to sedate the calf so he doesn't injure himself any further and so I can treat his wounds. Here, you do it. He extended the pistol so the handle was facing Casey. The calf cried at Casey's back. He took the pistol from the man and saw a dart loaded in the barrel. Who are you and why are you here? The name's Hondo Kildare. He tipped the brim of his hat. I live just up from the park on this side of the river. I'm a retired BIA special agent. As in Bureau of Indian Affairs? That's right, Hondo said. Have any identification? Back at the farm, I heard gunshots this morning from across the river. Got all my binoculars and saw an oil drill under construction and a bunch of men running around, some of them with guns. I saw the drill too and my co-worker heard the gunshots. That's why I came here to investigate. Then I stumbled across this little guy. The calf was gazing up at him with puppy dog eyes. He placed more pretzels on the rock and this time it ate them without hesitation. Heard him bawling this morning. Found him here and his mother across the river. Bullet in her heart. Calf must have swum across the river trying to get to safety. I went to my ATV and grabbed my tranquilizer and came back to find you here. Casey eyed him. What was your plan after you tranquilized it? Left my ATV at the edge of your park, was going to sedate it and head back to my house to get my pontoon. Have a hoist in my shop and was going to bring that on the pontoon to get this cat back to the farm to care for it. Was also going to take care of the remains of the mother. I've met Ranger Beekler before and I figured I could accomplish this before she ever made her way out here if you know what I mean. Casey smirked. You're right, but you'd be breaking like a dozen federal laws by taking this calf and its mother off park grounds. The calf moaned again but with more intensity. I suppose that's true, but this calf needs immediate medical attention and someone that can care for it now that it lost its mother. I can do that and quicker with your help or... You can go alert your superiors, fill out 17 forms, wait for guidance from Washington, and hope they allow you to act. Meanwhile, this calf suffers in the vultures and wolf snack on his mother's carcass. Casey's eyes shifted between the tranquilizer in his hands and the calf in the reeds. All his training and years of watching his father told him to go by the book, report this up the chain, and let the cards fall. He also knew everything Hondo just said was true, and he didn't want the calf to suffer. He remembered the year of red tape piled sky high for him to get his rescue program approved, and that was with all parties involved offering support. What should I do, Nolan? What would you do? Casey thought. He gazed into the calf's eyes and swore he saw tears forming at the edges. He handed the tranquilizer back to Hondo. I'll let you sedate it, but do it quick. We need to get your pontoon down here before any park visitors hike out this way.